man who brings the infamous decade to an end is this man, Juan Perón. He's a military man as well, as you can see, but he is also quite different. As you can also see, he is a charmer. Uh, his smile, look at that smile, right? His smile is so constant and relentless and charming that his political opponents call him Colonel Kalinas after a very popular brand of Argentine toothpaste. Uh, he, he is a man on the rise, and he is very different from the military men, even though he takes power in a military coup as well. He's very different from the people who came before him. And the reason he's different is he really reaches out to organized labor. He charms the unions, and he, in fact, he begins to use them as a base of his political support. Now, as you can imagine, this policy is extremely unpopular with the people who had been in power up to that point. And so eventually they arrest Perón, they put him in jail. And when he, they do, something extremely remarkable happens. There is a mass invasion of the center of Buenos Aires, mainly by labor union members. Some say close to a million people, probably more like a 500,000 people, but they come streaming in. And this is kind of a revolutionary moment. And the reason it's so revolutionary, in part, is because Buenos Aires is a really buttoned up kind of middle class place. If you walk down certain streets in Buenos Aires, uh, gentlemen must wear jackets. <laughs> if you're not wearing a jacket, you're kicked out. Okay? So when these people come streaming in and they're bathing their feet in the fountains and they're climbing the trees, uh, you know, no one can believe what the, the, our middle class Argentines call them the shirtless ones, the camisados. I think that most of them are wearing shirts, but uh, it's a reference to uh, Victor Hugo, to Les Miserables. Uh, so people are absolutely shocked that this has happened. Uh, the uh, leaders of Argentina at that point are so terrified, they decide they have to let Perón out of jail. Not only that, they decide they let, have to allow free and fair elections, which they do. Perón wins, not by a lot, uh, but... Uh, uh, about 52, 51% of the vote, he wins. And his government with Eva Perón is totally different than anything that's come before. He's still backing the unions. He's still relying on the unions for his support. And not only that, he and Evita, they live their personal lives in public. A, a profile of them in the New Yorker magazine says, they are madly, passionately, nationally in love. They conduct love affairs with the people of Argentina with the greatest openness. They're the perfect lovers, kind, considerate, caring in every detail. And indeed, it's true. No detail is too small. Eva Perón in the famous Eva Perón Foundation, she's there 12 hours a day receiving visitors from the poor. They come asking for things, you know, football for a football, child's football league, children's football league, sewing machine to start a small business, medicine for a sick relative, something, sometimes something bigger. Maybe it's a school. Maybe it's a, a hospital. And when she builds a hospital, the Everprone Foundation does build these bigger things as well. And when they build a hospital, it's a hospital, not like a charity hospital that the Catholic Church would have built. It's a hospital to the standard that the rich in Buenos Aires would use. And it may seem like a waste of money, and in a sense it is a waste of money, but Eva Perón's point is she's not giving away charity, she's giving away dignity. 